other banks failing as well at the time? Um, I don't recall if it forced other banks to fail necessarily. Um, other banks failed after that, but they failed on their own failures, not not as a direct result of eBank. Um, as far as consequences go, though, um, every single person who was involved with eBank uh, had their reputation dragged through the mud. And that's, that's, putting that's it really what I was... I didn't want to put it out there in, 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 in big uh, words and, and bend a knee on, but what Hex did, at least as far as I could tell, is he built this extreme level of trust and professionalism, and then one single guy ripped it all apart, and the result sure. afterwards was that there was no trust, it was impossible to build something, and the 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 MD was so fearful of anyone trying to make anything again. Yeah, and I what I tried to do was I tried at the time, and there's threads on the old forum on this. Uh, what I tried to do, so a little bit of backstory. <clears throat> when I built the governance at eBank, um, when it first started, right, I knew exactly how I wanted it to run because I had seen companies, big, giant global companies run. I knew how they govern themselves. I knew how I wanted eBank to govern itself. I gave the directors the power and the ability to um, to remove me, and they did. And that had been in, they had that power for two years. They exercised it finally. Why did they do it, though? Did they feel that removing you as the head of it might, might help to restore confidence in some way, or did they just do it out of some form of, you know, fuck you, get out? Um... You know, it's hard to say. Um, I don't think they were happy with me for obvious reasons, right? I mean, this was my invention. I had all I had solicited all of them to join. Um, they were all going to take a personal hit in terms of reputation as a result of of me getting them involved in this in this mess. Um, when everyone wanted to stop and retreat and wind down. I was the only one that wanted to exercise the nuclear option and do the IPO, which I knew in my mind would work. And um, I wouldn't give it up. And they basically said, look, you're, you're crazy. <laughs> and uh, it's a bad idea and we won't be party to it. And um, since you won't drop it, you're gonna leave. It was a total Steve Jobs. Yeah. You basically and got so, asked for the only solution that would have worked and not just worked. I keep saying it would have worked perfectly. Well, and remember how in the beginning I told you about how a lot of people like to admire the problem and I'm always trying to figure out how to move forward and, and, and actually make things work, even if they don't work 100%. That was, I mean, I did that till the end. <clears throat> the, the problem is that, that as I saw it from the sideline, as, uh, and, and you know this because I, I was trying to encourage more than just you to do this you never got to use all the benefits of shares right and you had all the knowledge about how to use that how to split them how to make voting shares how to make some of them not voting shares how to make a shell company and all these things it could have gone so far but because they got it got cock blocked by the people that that didn't like it. Right. it it was dead and, and it's because they didn't understand this and and that's why the education aspect that you keep coming up with is so important because thinning something uh with, with emissions doing doing splits doing buybacks doing buybacks of own shares before something Dirk, you you you, you know, know what we're talking about right and that's the thing one of the things i always wanted to do was to actually i had this i had this whole plan right i mean I don't want to make myself seem like some kind of like, you know, evil, mad genius kind of guy. I was already looking beyond the recapitalization of the bank. I was looking at stock buybacks. I was looking at how to actually manipulate the market price of the shares to make a profit on them. Exactly. That, that, that's how the, it's, it's happening in the real world, right? We have we have interest yeah. rates of nothing and corporations keep buying their own shares with loans. Right. And nothing. I wanted to... I wanted to buy the shares at a discount and then sell them at a profit because it would be a very scalable way <laughs> to make a lot of money. And so I wanted to basically rebuild the, the bank on the back of the investor. And that wasn't malice. That wasn't, uh, it was, it was pure competition is what it was. And I thought, you know, one of the ways forward, remember I, I mentioned the three ways to make money. 
I wanted to tap into the stock market, which at the time and still is uh, not mature. Um, unfortunately, the infrastructure wasn't ready. It wasn't in place. There were a number of, of issues and difficulties with it, um, but we weren't able to do it. They kicked me out. I took 100% responsibility for the fall of eBank. It was in this big resignation post that I, I, I did. In fact, I bet I could find it. All I have to do is search for X resignation. Yeah, here it is. Wow, first, first link too. Um, uh yeah uh so let me see. <laughs> here it is so click on that link there <clears throat> i said resigned um they voted me out so but i didn't i didn't want to um i wanted to make it look like i was taking the hit and i was taking full responsibility i did not want them to um be put in a negative light, which is why I phrased it the way I did. Uh, but it was a pretty short note. I apologize. I full apology, full apology. Um, mentioned my appreciation. I I gave up all the all the money I had in my e bank account. I completely uh, gave up, and I liquidated pretty much all of my assets and and gave them to the bank. So I took full accountability, full responsibility for everything that happened, and I basically turned myself into a pauper um, and never recovered from it. I think that's what I'm hoping for and why I'm doing these things. It's bringing back the, the, the trusted financial market, right? Because after you yeah. left and af after the, 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 the whole number of scams that followed, right? Since then, there's been no real trust no real public trading of anything uh, everything has gone underground and now anything to do with markets on a big scale is done in in alliance uh, back rooms with uh, uh, very big and wealthy players right which is terrible not for moral reasons so let me tell you why that's awful okay um besides the fact that it's 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 not fair right and it's not moral, it's not ethical. Um, it introduces a really big problem. For any market to be efficient, it needs to be transparent. Transparent markets are efficient markets. Markets that are liquid are efficient markets, right? If uh, things are being traded between alliances, that's not a liquid market, that's not a transparent market, and it's not an efficient market, which means there's pricing irregularities, there's um, arbitrage, there's all kinds of, of bad things. Basically, the market's not healthy. For a market to be healthy, it needs to be accessible to everybody and fully transparent. And that, that ties back into the whole thing that a lot of the things that, that CTP could do by bringing in some minor features might actually help alleviate this. Because now I was talking to uh, Marshall Mallow the other day, and one of the things that Citadels introduces is the whole thing of spreading out the, the, the um, geography and stuff like that. But one of the things that we touched upon was the problem with industry and the problem with markets that we have this thing called a hard ceiling of, of orders, right? And industry slots, right? You, you, yeah. you, don't, you don't use your budgets and your accounting to create or calculate your uh, marginal costs. You have this, this limitation <clears throat> that's hard coded in the skills instead of letting players run wild and some will lose and someone will win that's necessary for an efficient market that there is that, that, that there is no limit there is no barrier of entry like that uh i mean you know supply of services in a market being limited i don't think it's the worst thing in the world it does create you know demand it does raise prices um it does limit but so long as it's transparent right and and anyone can participate or a great deal of people can participate. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but citadels are definitely adding a lot of complexity when it comes to the conversation about what is a good market and what's a bad market, right? Um, what is good? What is a good market look like? Um, I'm just uh, I, I'm I'm just advocating for the for the point that that when there is a hole in the market as an industrialist, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that you need to push into these. Uh, multiple alt accounts to be able to then go in and service that hole or yeah. overexpose yourself by 
making too many battleships. That's one of those references yeah. that are quite funny because it took two years to, to, to deplete that stock, right? But, but the fact that, yeah. that if there had been e even more overexposure from the industrialists because there was no hard limit, then it would have been even more entertaining because then the prices would have crashed because of this, right? And yeah. people would have taken huge losses. And, and it's the same with the, with the market orders. If you let market orders uh, expand out, right, then there will be overexposure. There will be locked up assets and, and, and things like that. Of course, as long as we have the, the margin scam option where we can clear our own escrows and have free orders on the market, that's a different story. But they need to remove yeah. these skill-based hard limits and, and make them uh, benefits so so they they tweak some number in the game right like industry index has been in, introduced so the cost to produce is higher in the active areas like in jita and you could have something similar to uh, in market so if you're trading in jita your marginal cost will be higher yeah yeah i mean it's it it creates a more complex uh, landscape when it comes to the operation of the market and what's what's expensive in one versus you know the other. That's where the pricing is so important, right? You've got to understand your your costs because if you don't understand your costs, how how do you decide your price? Your price should be a function of your cost plus how much money you want to make, right? And if you don't know these things, then what you the price you charge, you're guessing, and you're yeah, not it's it's very right. broad estimations. Yeah. And, and, and it works, it works well enough, but without understanding, um, it really limits what you can do because say I, um, run a very successful business, right? Say I need a lot of money and I want to borrow that money. And the borrower says, well, you know, what's your profit margin? How much money are you making? Uh, I don't know. But my, my nap keeps going up. You know, and, 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 and I think that's because of these, but I'm not really sure because it could be this other group of products that I'm selling. And depending on what happens in this region versus that region, it could completely destroy my profits. Maybe because I don't even understand where I'm coming, they're coming from. You know, there's a lot of really cool stuff you could do with finance instruments, but not understanding how um, you get your profit and your cost of goods sold, it really limits it. And I mean, the accounting stuff, I waved that flag for a long time on, we need accounting software. We need accounting software. Finally, Sens and I tried to tackle it and we just ran into so many problems with it. Um, well, I mean, with, with the, with the changes that they've made in terms of the API crest data that's available out there. Yeah. Is this something that somebody can create using a third party, you know, you know, a third party creates an app that converts these numbers that come out of the API into more realistic accounting numbers? You would have to. Um... Well, it's basically a little bit like what uh, Geronica is trying to do with Mogul, but I think he's running into <laughs> some of those problems that it's not the right formats and it's not easy to do. And Geronica does not know about uh, double entry bookkeeping. So the accounting system that he's making is really not working in a way that a proper accounting person would need right yeah so i just linked a post that i published in 2009 in uh actually did it? yep yeah it worked i just posted take a look at that this was uh seven about six and a half years ago, actually. Yeah, that's a while back. Yeah, this is exactly what we're talking about right now. But I mean, I mean, really, it, it, it can be a long time back, but really, nothing's changed. It it hasn't, and and it's when you when you look at the API, um, getting the API data, whether it's from Crest or the traditional API. When you look at the journal entries and it says um, the kind of transaction type that it is, that's the key because transaction type dictates uh, what kind of accounting entry it is and how it should be handled, right? And if I can't reliably understand what the different transaction types translate to, to from an accounting perspective. The granularity isn't there. Right, it's not. 
and it doesn't match up one to one with the accounting. And we actually, I think we called out exactly which ones they were. Let me see if it's in this thread. Because he and I mapped this all out. We took, we spent like a month figuring it out. It's either in this thread or it's in another thread, but we had actually identified what all the accounting entries should be based on the journal type. It's probably in another thread. It was actually pretty crazy. Oh, here. Now, I think we did it in another thread. Ah, I'm depressed now. Come on. But this this thread, by the way, um, exhaustively covers this topic. Um, and at the time, it was a pretty good conversation for the community to have. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the problem was without, you know, CCP making those adjustments to the journal types and the transaction types, we couldn't reliably translate them into the correct accounting entries. And without being able to do that, you're stuck with semi-automated accounting, which requires a lot of manual adjustments for accounting entries, which means no one's going to do it because... And then you've got the, the slump in the MD that came in about the same time when people started migrating to other social media tools, right? So. So you got a lot of people that might have been able to take part in that conversation. They kind of left because the Evo yeah. forums became sort of like a back burner thing that uh, you really didn't use. Yeah. The, uh, so, you know, when you think about channels, um, so uh, communication channels, right? Uh, with Eve, the communication channel for a very long time was the Eve forums. That was the only channel you had, right? But now you've got Reddit, you've got uh, you know something awful, you've got uh, Twitter, you've got all these other different channels of communication, um, which means that sometimes these discussions that are technical in nature, that are very specific to a narrow group of the player base, um, they get drowned out in the noise of other topics which appeal to a larger portion of the player base. Right now, with all these different channels of communication, um, you know, the, the loudest people win when it comes to what the topic of conversation is, right? And funny enough, and ironically enough, because that ties back to the whole birth of the MD, because when, when the MD was born, that yes. was actually the Remember result that. of the want to buy <laughs> and trade channel. So anyone trying to have a conversation would just be flooded out by the trade stuff, the spam, yeah. right? And, and it's the same situation again. Anyone that wants to have a serious conversation gets flooded out by uh, people going apeshit like Finodan that just got banned because he's been flooding the, the forums. And the forums are basically dead. So we have to move to new platforms and figure out how to uh, meet up with the right people, right? And, and that's a platform thing. And it's tough because we tried to do that with uh, eBank. We actually tried to move people to the eBank forums because there were problems we had with, with differences of opinion with moderation on the EVE MD forums. And so we tried to actually move people to the eBank forums to evade um, our, try to avoid having differences of opinions with the moderators, which we sometimes had because um, we got into some arguments with them. It didn't work. Do you think that, that with the tools that we have now, that we might actually be able to get a more mature and professional conversation going because we can do these things in, in Slack and, yeah. and poke in dev fleet and talk in the lounge and do private rooms and, and all know, these tools are now available and, and doing yeah. video calls and streaming them and all that, right? Things we didn't you know, even have back then. You might be right. And one of the big things is if you look back at the posts that I used to make, um, when I posted the IPO template, it wasn't a Word document on Dropbox. It was text that I had crafted to format the MD forms, right? Exactly. And, and now we can do all these things. We can use proper embedded uh, PDFs and, and put them in all the right places. And we can do video tutorials of how to do it and explain to EVE players how to do a SWOT analysis and how that ties into the accounting and all these things is it's kind of possible now it's very easy it it actually it might be it might be and i think that uh, what you guys are doing is um 
you know, a big part of that new method of communication, right? Um, taking, taking you guys back, um, way, way back, way, way back. We're talking 2006, 2007. Um, when somebody came into MD and they didn't abide by the MD's social norms and rules, they didn't stay. They were drowned out, argued out. Um, people knew what was happening. They knew the arguments to make. Um, they would dress down the people that weren't serious. It was really good at self-policing. It was incredible at self-policing. It was a self-regulating uh, form in a lot of ways. Um, but and that it tilted, right? It tilted into bad exclusivity. So any new yes, person that, that might message. want to get into stuff felt left out or ignored or shouted out, right? And that's basically why I created Little Lounge. That was to, to get away from that mm, backroom cigar waving exclusivity, right? Yes, and, and I will admit to being part of that. Um, well, yeah, but, yeah, but there's something to be said about, about uh, trying to maintain some semblance of order in a place where, you know, again, you just look at the forums for any reason or any of these places, right? When you know that you have people there that are attempting to disrupt. <laughs> The problem was that if anyone uh, asked a question like... The anomalous like, nature of the internet. If, if anyone came in and was a noob and actually wanted to learn all these things and they asked a silly question like, what is a nav? They would get trolled out and, and ridiculed so badly. Uh, it was an elitist atmosphere. Oh, indeed. It, it was extremely it was. elitist. It was. It was. And, and you know... The thing, one of the things I regret <clears throat> is that um, I I played a part in creating that atmosphere. Um, you know, the way that I went about things, I can say this in hindsight, right? Um, I and, and Caleb, you probably remember this. I had a certain tone that I used. Yeah, but the the point is that that you had a tone that might seem arrogant, but you were always really helpful when people took the time. The problem was all your proselyte thingies that followed you and wanted to mimic you, and they were horrible. And then when 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 the threads started being ugly, then people like Shah and Sister and and mm, types like that yeah. came in and just they were horrible to new people. Well, here here let me let me give you a literal quote quote that I got from somebody a little while ago in an, in an off Slack. Now this this person is you know kind of a very low key kind of laid back and she's like you know i had no you know i had no interest in any of it um you know she started to watch for a little bit uh, i had no interest in any of it um i was like ew eve bank or one of these game banks and he sounded a bit smug for my taste i said um i said uh it's funny i don't get smug out of him at all but i'm also used to dealing with wall street types so the sense of smug gets degraded when you've seen true evil i mean smugness <laughs> yeah i mean I, I, I'm not going to pretend I'm something I'm not, you know, I'm, you know, I, I have a particular background. Um, I've worked for companies doing consulting stuff. I'm a, I'm a consultant. That's what I do. Um, you know, the, my mannerisms, behavior, the way I speak, it's all influenced by where I, I came from, which is working with these big bureaucratic organizations, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I, I hope I don't come off as smug. I understand that sometimes I do. It sucks. Can we just like, point out? It's like when you dark. Talk to somebody outside the industry. I mean, you know, you know, if you're, but believe me, you want to see smug sit across the table from a hedge fund manager who's had a good year <laughs> and try to get him to tell you how he did it. You know, and, and all it's exuding from him is smug. And can we yeah. can we just put in the standard right now in 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 this day and age that compared to Aerith, he's a fluffy care bear. Oh, I, oh, God, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you know, the, the, I, I do I do recognize that there was a tone and there was, uh, you know, the sort of conversations, despite how I might have carried on, you know, those individual conversations, I created in some way, you know, the, the atmosphere, right? And um, I, I, the, the whole complaint about elitism is completely legitimate, and I definitely played a part in it. And I think I remember you, and I think you're still pursuing this. You had a much more democratic approach to everything, and and um, I many times, you know, I would I would say things like, "This is not a democracy," 
I don't run a democracy. There, there's nothing democratic about what I do. Well, it's, you have to you have to consider the fact that that as I understood what you were doing, you were still trying to 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 prove yourself and 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 make money and and make this big project. When when all this happened, I just came back from a, a break and I had already been in the big project, right? I was in the whole beginning with, with Naga and Stepstone that financed Big Blue, that uh, ended up financing uh, the Mercenary Coalition and, and then it just <laughs> failscaped uh, totally. But the point was I had already been part of the big things and what I really loved was the backroom talk and the socializing and what is now recognized as the meta game, right? I loved yeah. the fact that I could could have people in in, in in chat channels and talk to them about weird ideas and 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 that's why I did what I did and 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 when I saw what you were doing to the MD, I was so inspired and wanted to use that and expand it into this whole new type of gameplay and and I, yeah. and, and I think we succeeded to some extent with all our different projects to make something that was really entertaining in that era. So, but but when Rick Dick did what he did. It all fell apart. So what uh, the fundamental difference between my approach and your approach is while I was able to exert greater control over what happened and more influence, direct influence I could apply individually speaking, um, what I did was not sustainable. What you did was and is. And that's and why approach, I hope that, that maybe in the future you would, the little time that you might have, if you might want to actually do some of that educating thing and and write some some articles or posts or things that can actually help people understand this because it is very difficult to explain these topics and i, th I think dirk will agree that that when lock fox and and myself and even dirk uh, goes on on a rant about finance and and stuff like that it gets a little bit hard to follow and we need more mm, easy access stuff and that's why it's so nice when, when when reaver then takes us down a notch or marshall takes us down a notch and says okay we have to explain this as if i'm five and that that's actually key you know this whole thing about education i think is one of the biggest the biggest things it's the most important thing is is making complicated things simple and easy because remember the easier it is to do the more likely it is to happen People understanding this and understanding it in a simple way means it's more likely that they'll they'll pursue it, that they'll do it, that they'll talk about it with their friends. Um, having writing articles is is all well and good, but um, you know one of the things that I did many years ago, and I'm sure it's still out there somewhere, is I did a recording of a two-hour trading workshop that I did, and I did it back in like I think it was like 2006, and that thing was floating around for years. Um, it's probably still out there somewhere. And I broke it down in an outline. I described everything as simple as I could. And um, and people liked that. That was that that ended up being pretty good. Um, but you know, having these kind of conversations. I used to do um, do you remember the Eve morning report? Uh, no. Eric Mum would uh, run through the numbers and say tritanium's up by 0.5% today. Um, and it, Dirk, Dirk, do you, you you're not you remember this? Yeah, yeah, I do remember that. And in fact, um, there was an element of that that uh, back when I was doing the New Eden Update, which was a daily, like, 15-minute uh, podcast that we were putting out, we had this part in there about markets, you know, and I would, you know, and I would try and call it out the way that, you, you know, the way that you would, you know, for those things, right? But to some extent, it was more just gag, right? You know, that, uh, yeah. you know, it was there just to be like, this should be in the news, right? You should talk about what the markets yeah. are doing in the news. Yeah. So um, I actually got an email uh, from NPR about that, um, and which and it's it, it was a show that was influenced by NPR and and um, and the the money market stuff that they do there. Um, he, it was Eric Mum was the gentleman that uh, ran it, and uh, he and I are, are we were always talking. Uh, he really likes me for whatever reason. And uh, I, you know, I occasionally would, would get on these long form weekend podcasts for the morning report. Um, he's actually bringing that back. He's got some spreadsheets I've been helping him out with, um, how to actually calculate um, mineral baskets for the top, I think it's, we settled on the top three regions. And so the idea is to create mineral baskets that um, provide insight to price fluctuations by, on a region by region basis. 
And so if you see a, a basket move violently in a short period of time in one region versus another, you can begin to draw some conclusions from that, right? And it might be that certain materials in high demand, well, okay, what, what requires a, a, a huge amount of that material? That's going to be the stuff that's likely impacting it. Um, what does that mean? If it's a lot of missiles, does it mean something for um, you know fleet doctrines and fittings? Um, there's a lot of interesting tangents you can explore when you get into trying to speculate on price movements. So um, I'm hoping he goes through it and and so forth and brings it back because I think it would be fairly interesting stuff and also something that would get people more uh, talking more about um, market issues. So. Yeah, well, yeah, that's why it was, it was interesting for me when Lock Fox went and began doing his show and began actually creating, um, um, you know, charts for for technical analysis, being able to look <laughs> at, I, I swear, being able to look at things like MACD and yeah. relative strength on something like the Plex market. Uh, you know, it, you know, these yeah. are h highly liquid markets in this game to where, you know, it matters. Now, when he starts looking at other things like tech two components, it breaks down, but on some of these well, you know, high volume, high liquidity markets, it, it, it's actually quite interesting to look at. Yeah, and they should follow the patterns. Um, so if you're looking at candlestick charts, finance candlestick charts, um, you should see the same kind of patterns of behaviors and price movements um, with a highly liquid market in EVE. I mean, because there's no reason that they wouldn't, right? Those patterns are determined by human behavior, irregardless right. of whether they occur in EVE or in the financial world. So as long as the conditions are similar, highly liquid markets, right? You should see the same exact thing, which means you get to apply the same lessons and learnings from the real world into EVE, which is the fun yep. part, right? Well, exactly. And that and that really is, you know, so much about these conversations that are had, right? It is about trying to bring in real world philosophies and theories into this highly dynamic market in this game. Yeah, but it can be done. It is it has, possible. It can be done. It's just, you know, it, yes. it, it, it's just very difficult from the standpoint of, of it can be done at least initially from from a small group. Which is which is why I have no problem with the dictator approach to kind of you know the you know, the discussion that that takes place in the early stages, right? Because you need to get the core group that of people that can be trusted that you know the, that can participate in something. You get it off the ground with that, and then you try to expand it outwards in you know and 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 lever it up by bringing in the general public. Yeah, it's, it, it is it is very difficult, though, to make that transition um, from something that, while is effective, isn't necessarily sustainable, right? And the sustainability um, ties into the, the risk, right? Because it's good to have these small groups. The problem is that if the group stays small, you have a high risk, right? You have these hit by bus yeah. problems, right? Or um, we, ethics we, problem, by right? By the way, we revised that. And now it's, we, we um, hit by a bus is a phrase I've used a lot in business. I use now the phrase, win the lottery. <laughs> Positive. <laughs> because the same thing happens. You win the lottery, you're not going to be around anymore. <laughs> you're, exactly. you're like, see, ya, I'm in Puerto Rico from now on, man. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> but anyway, sorry to interrupt you. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, smaller groups are prone to risk in that you know one or two of the the people that are drivers in the group could could vacate and then all of a sudden the group is 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 gutted rick dick was um essential not just from a um you know he had a lot of money he was one of the leaders him and i uh, were the the big thought leaders at, at ebank a lot of the directors had some good ideas but um there were about half the directors were what I would say are thought leaders, right? They were really generating the ideas, they were deciding the direction, they were talking about strategy. And the others were participants, active participants, but not necessarily leaders, right? Which is fine. Um, they provided their opinion and their own recommendations and their own advice, and they voted. There, there was voting. Um, but you had this small group of, of thought leaders. Rick Dick was one of them, he got taken out then I get kicked out. And so they had like maybe one person left who was willing to talk about 
strategy and think about it. it and he had a different agenda as far as I remember. He, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to speak poorly of him because, you know, honestly, think about it. You run a bank for two years. Your, your whole reputation is tied up in this thing. It's going to hell. Um, everybody thinks it's your fault. <laughs> Everyone's pissed at you. I mean, put yourself in their shoes. They were in an incredibly, incredibly difficult situation. Um, and it's really hard to second guess them and, and, and judge them for, for what they did and why they did it. At the end of the day, though, the loss was, of their e reputation was on the line. Right. And, and like I said, everyone, everyone lost it. Every single person that was directly involved in eBank um, had their reputation destroyed. All of them. Well, because the only thing easier to say than trust no one is scammer. Yeah. And that's and when, that's when it goes about. wrong. Yeah. And, and it wasn't a scam. And here's the thing. It was actually a legitimate business failure. And those happen. Absolutely. And that's okay. Uh, right? a, a funny story that happened after you left, actually. I did an IPO launch. I tried to do it as professional as possible. And I actually tried to use some of your ideas. Um, and the corporation that was launched had a 350% return of investment before he burned out right yes and it was yes. still called a scam after the burnout yeah. because it burned out because it shut down even though it had actually paid out all its investors 350 yeah. percent they were still so you, angry that it didn't continue you successfully executed your exit plan right you liquidated you paid out the investors they got their money back and then some and so by every definition, that was an unqualified success. You, you, you were completely 100% successful. Oh, it was um, an actual uh, shares thing. It was not an, uh, it, it was not a bond. It was a, sh it was shares and it ran for a little bit over a year and paid out monthly. And the total was 350%. And they yeah, exchanged was... hands many times. But the point was that when he then burned out and said, I can't play Eve anymore, I think it was. If I'm not mistaken, it might actually have been some private stuff, but he couldn't play anymore. So he had to stop and yeah. it had still been a very successful business and people called it a scam and still do. Yeah, yeah it's uh, people. Um, part of the thing that I tried to do was to help people understand what some of those words meant, what some of the concepts were. And um, it's one of those things that you can't just do once and walk away from. You have to continually educate and, and clarify. Uh, words have very specific meanings, use specific words for specific reasons. Scam always, always in the entire history of the MD from the time I first set foot in it, people used the word scam inappropriately. It was used too broadly. It wasn't understood very well when it was used, what it meant. And oh, it, it's the, it's the money. I mean, it's just like, you know, real money trading, yeah. you know, at this point. Yeah. And it's a, it's a blanket word. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It was a total blanket word. And that was awful because you couldn't really talk about legitimate failure anymore, right? Because there is such a thing. There is such a thing as a legitimate failure. And failure in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but you couldn't have those conversations about failure because it was reduced to scam. And the conversation ended, right? So, all right, guys. I... Have to go. I know. Uh, hey, just great, one... great conversation. I'm going to tell you right now. I really appreciated this conversation tonight because you know, there was there was so much history in here. Let alone just the you know the topic itself, right? There was so much history in here that, that this is great. But again, this is yeah, this is kind of what we do. You know, well, what a few people do in Eve, you know, right? Is is you talk about grand ideas and thoughts and concepts that you know probably don't have a chance of panning out. But it's always interesting to like get a chance to talk to those people that have actually tried to make it happen. And I, I, I was just going to say one thing. I did actually still let the uh, recording run. So I just want to ask if anyone has an issue if I put the post out as well at some point. No, yeah. everything's fine for me. You can, you can post yeah, because whatever. there's not that much upsake in, this, in these kind of things, really. So. I, oh, man, I shouldn't have been picking my nose the whole time. No, it's it's fine. It's thanks fine. a lot for doing this, Hex, uh, and yeah. I hope that you will come back in some future and talk about other things. 
I would be happy to, guys. I mean, you know, give me give me a little bit of a heads up. Um, I schedule my whole damn life now, and uh, the trick is <laughs> this is the this is the trick. Okay, yeah, the bank thing can happen, but you first you open a casino, you print money, <laughs> and then you back a bank with it. <laughs> you know, exactly. If I was going to do it today, what I would do is I would open a bond market. And I would only allow alliances to create bonds and I would charge people on transactions because people have an incredible demand for uh, tradable in, you know, instruments, right? Equity or, or debt instruments. And we saw this. I mean, whenever there was an exchange, it was, it, was, it was definitely used. But if it was easy to use and everyone could use it and it was relatively simple, right? And people had a large selection of things to trade. Think about how active that could be. My whole evil master plan was to control the infrastructure of the financial system. It was never to control the actual bank itself. I wanted to control the infrastructure. The bank was a step in the process. I just never got to where I wanted to be because the bank failed. You're going to get eventually, contacted by people that want you as a consultant. <laughs> yeah. But eventually I wanted to control the movement of money and equity and debt. That's what I wanted because at that point, you know, if you want to do, if you wanted the virtualization of shares, all of that was meant so that I could actually control the basic infrastructure because whoever controls the infrastructure controls everything. Whoever owns the roads owns everything, right? I wanted to be the guy on the toll road saying, you, you can all go on the road. I made a pretty road for you. It works great. You'll love it. It's fast, gets you where you want to be. All you have to do is every single one of you has to pay me a small amount of money. And that eventually adds up to a tremendous sum, which I can then use for other financial ventures and uh, experiments. So very soon. Um, yes, but that never, I was never able to realize that plan. It was a, uh, it was a dream. So, but hey guys, I really appreciate the conversation. Um, I don't usually get to have these kind of conversations for many reasons, but um, it, it's always fun to talk about it. And um, I do hope that it is helpful to people. Um, you know, it, it, it always makes me feel really good to know that uh, something that I've done has contributed in a positive way to the community um, and to people. And so um, I'm happy to continue to do this so long as you want to invite me, I will try to find a way to make it happen where I can have these discussions with you. I will so. definitely give you a better warning next time. Thanks for doing this. Thank you, David. Okay. All right, guys. Take it easy. Thanks. Have a great one.